Welcome to our service this evening. It's lovely to see Angela and David. So lovely to see you again. And pray that you'll be blessed as you share with us. And thank you for the rest of you for coming. I wondered, by way of introduction, especially for those who are listening online, that I should give some reasons why I'm here tonight. And can I suggest this too? The first one is that when I was 17 years old, uh, that was 1951, I accepted the invitation of the minister to ask the Lord Jesus to come into my heart and my life. I confirmed that by witnessing at my baptism and therefore my first reason why I'm here. But the second is slightly different. I'm going back now to a long time ago, some 55 years perhaps, and I just will share with you what has happened in the years between when I was converted at 17 and the 73 years that I've been a believer in the Lord Jesus. And for those of you who are watching online, it's a pleasure and a privilege to speak to you. And I think it's appropriate that I just introduce myself. The members of Chartridge may know me very well, and some of us go back over 50 years of fellowship and friendship, and that's very valuable to me. It's been said that life, Christian life, is not a bed of roses. The implication being, of course, that our Christian life doesn't guarantee that we won't have our problems. During those 73 years, I'd like to suggest, in fact, that for me, the experiences I've had are like roses. I'll tell you why. If I, if you'd let me lay you on a bed of roses, you might be surrounded by a sweet perfume. Roses are supposed to be one of the favorite perfumes in the world. But at the same time, if you try to move, then you'd realize just what horrible thorns roses have got. And that, I think, has been my experience in my life. There's been the heights of love and blessing. There's been the depth of grief and pain and sorrow, and probably most things in between. And that's the second reason I suggest that I'm here tonight, that I've got experience. Many years ago, when I was uh, left the Air Force in 55, I needed two pieces of paper. One of them was to tell my prospective employer that I was qualified to meet the standards that he had advertised for in the job application. The second thing was that I realised I needed something that would tell the prospective employer about me and there was something in those days called a CV, a curriculum vitae and when I sent the applications for jobs it was important that I sent the CV as well because that gave the prospective employer the opportunity of assessing me before I had the appointment 
And that's what I suggest I can offer you tonight. My CV of 73 years trusting and believing in the Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus did say himself in John's Gospel, in the world you'll have trouble. And I think we can all agree with that, can't we? But he also said, fear not, I have overcome the world. And I think that's a tremendous blessing to any Christian, that irrespective of what life throws at us, we can always remember that the Lord Jesus is still in charge, yeah. irrespective of circumstances. So they're the two things that uh, I wanted to remind you about and why I'm able to say that I feel that I've got the qualifications to share some thoughts with you this evening, especially on the uh, worship and praise and thanksgiving that we're going to give to God. Now, if you'd like to take your Bibles, I've got to some verses to read. The first one is from Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 to 13. And I'm reading from the New International Version because I know some of you, perhaps you're listening, uh, may not be familiar with the uh, normal hymn, the normal Bible, King James Version, but as an ex Plymouth brethren, I was brought up on the King James Version. So I thought we'd try and in between now, and this is from the New International Version. And we're going to start reading at verse 1. And when man be, began to increase in numbers on the earth, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they married, and any of them they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit will not contend with man forever, for he is mortal, his days will be a hundred and twenty years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterwards, when the sons of God went to the daughters of men and children by them, they were the heroes of men of old. The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the heart was only evil continually, all the time. The Lord was grieved that he made man on the earth, and his heart was filled with pain. So the Lord said, I will wipe out mankind, whom I have created from the face of the earth, men and animals and creatures that move along the ground and birds of the air, for I am grieved that I have made them, but Noah found favour in the sight of God. And the second reading is from the Romans chapter 1, and I'm going to read the first verses from 1 to 24. I thank Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God, the gospel he promised beforehand through the prophets in the Holy Scriptures, regarding his son, uh, who as to his nature was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was dedicated with power to be the son of God by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him and for his name's sake, we received grace and apostleship to call people from among the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith. And you also are among those who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is being reported all over the world. God, whom I serve with my whole heart in preaching the gospel of his Son, is my witness how constantly I remember you in my prayers at all times. And I pray that now, at last, God's will, the way may be open for me to come to see you. Now I'm going to just skip on the two verses. And I'm going to start reading... Uh, from verse 18. 
The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse, neither glorified him as God, nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became futile, and foolish hearts were darkened. Although they came to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like mortal men and birds and animals and reptiles. And this is the verse I really wanted to concentrate on. Therefore God gave them over to their simple desires of their hearts, to sexual immorality, for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and worship and serve created things rather than the Creator himself. May God bless that reading to us. It says in the Gospel according to Matthew chapter 24, verses 6 and 7, And you will be hearing of wars and rumours of wars. See that you are not frightened, for these things must take place. But that is not yet the end. For nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famine, pestilences and earthquakes in various places. The same thought is also found in two other Gospels, the Gospel of Mark and Luke. The one thing that's missing in the other two versions is that when the Lord Jesus answers the disciples, they were going past the temple and Lord Jesus, uh, the disciples remarked on what a beautiful building it was. This was Herod the Great Temple. And the Lord Jesus said, in time there won't be a single stone left standing. And so they said, well, when will these things be? And he said this to them, but of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. And I'll talk about some aspects of the coming of the Lord Jesus to earth again, perhaps a little bit later in the talk. We've read already in Genesis chapter 5 that the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great upon the earth and every tent, intent and thought of his heart was only evil continually. He was sorry that he made the earth and he was grieved in his heart so he destroyed all human and animal life by flood. Only Noah, his three sons and their wives, and the animals taken into the ark with them were saved. Similar thought is found if we fast forward a little bit. Genesis chapter 6 verse 5 talks of God's punishment on Sodom and Gomorrah. Again, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great upon the earth and every thought and intent of his heart was only evil continually. He was sorry that he had made man on earth. He was grieved in his heart and that's when he said he would destroy them all. In between that and the second reading, which was one Roman, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah is very similar with respect to the state of Sodom and Gomorrah, the cities, as it was in the times of Noah. In fact, the Lord sent, I think with three angels, three people to tell Abraham that he was going to destroy the cities and to go and get his nephew and his wife and his daughters out of Sodom before that time came. And so the angel took them out of Sodom and Gomorrah and when they were safely away, he destroyed not only Sodom and Gomorrah, 
but the whole of the valley and everything in it. And it says it was fire and brimstone. Unfortunately, he also said that if anyone looks back, they'll be turned to a pillar of salt. And Abraham's, uh, Lot's wife couldn't resist looking back and he turned to a pillar of salt. Now, if we look to the New Testament, we read from Romans chapter 1. It said this, Gentile man changed the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. However, in this case, we learn from verse 24, God didn't destroy them as he'd done with the people of Sodom and Gomorrah in Noah's time. He did something completely different because we read in verse 24, God gave them over to the lusts of their heart, to impurity, that their bodies may be dishonored among them. People he was talking to were the Gentiles living in Rome at the time. And what he effectively said, because of their sinfulness, you've made your bed, you've turned away from me, now you go and lie in it. So he said, I'm going to give you over to your own devices, effectively saying, you've rejected me and I have rejected you. And I think that possibly might be the situation we're in in our world today. There's no need for me to remind you about the happenings of the last few weeks. Things that are happening and that they must be satanic because there's so much evil in what people are doing. They've rejected God, they're turning to their own ways, they're doing what they want to do. And consequently, we have problems like we had in the last two weeks. Those three little girls who died and all the riots. That was Satan's work. Somewhere else in the Bible it said that Satan was like a roaring and ravaging lion, seeing who, could de who he could devour. And I think that, in all fairness, in everything that we see around us, surely that's what's happening at the moment. It's so hard to try and imagine what some people are going through. And I know, Lord, that it's just that it's your will being done, but sometimes, Heavenly Father, what's happening is beyond our imagination, perhaps, and our understanding. That's the situation as I see it today. But there's a time coming and there's a warning when we think about what's happening in the world, what's happening in uh, our country, what's happening right across the world. There's a warning in that. Because one day the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come back to earth. And he's going to judge the world with righteousness. Can I just uh, clarify one or two things about the second coming? Uh, the verses in the scriptures would indicate that the Lord Jesus Christ will return to earth at different times. 1 Thessalonians 4 chapter verses 13 to 18 says that the church will be taken out instantly to be with the Lord Jesus in heaven. And that's called the rapture. At the same time, we read that the uh, prophet Zechariah prophesied 520 years before that the Lord Jesus Christ would return to earth and stand on the Mount of Olives. And the first advent, the coming of the Lord Jesus into the world as a baby, and the second advent, where he comes into the world to stand on the Mount of Olives, are the only references specifically I can find that relate to the actual events. The others are in between. It's just that there are verses in the scriptures that support some of the theories, but people, have, including me, you've got their own ideas of what they mean. 
to me, the rapture may or may not come. I believe that in this world, there's going to be more and more tribulation. The Bible talks about something called the Great Tribulation. It talks about the Lord Jesus coming to fight the Battle of Armageddon. He'll stand on the, the, uh, on the mountain of, uh, uh, in Jerusalem. He split the mountain, in, and it goes into graphic details of what's going to happen. And then there's going to be what they call the thousand years of peace when the Lord Jesus comes to reign. Can I suggest that the only positive thing, and I, I feel this myself, the only positive thing about all of that is the fact that one day the Lord Jesus Christ will come again. We don't know when, we don't know how, we don't know where. Was it three weeks ago a brother stood on this platform and was talking about a particular group of Christians and they believed that they could, they could give the time of the Lord Jesus when he's coming back. And of course, he didn't come back. And so they moved the time forward a bit just to justify what they'd said. But the end result, the actual basic thing I think for you and I to remember is the Lord Jesus Christ will come back in God's own time and in God's own way. And the other thing about it, the scripture tells us that when he comes back, it's going to be quick. It talks about in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, it's like lightning coming from the east and the west. The Lord Jesus will suddenly come back and the scriptures say to us, he will come back. We don't know when, but be prepared. And there are a couple of parables uh, that the Lord Jesus gave to indicate that uh, the Lord Jesus is coming back very suddenly. What will happen then when the Lord Jesus comes back? Well, we're told the Lord Jesus will take his world out of the church, the church out of the world in Mark's Gospel. And he also emphasizes that today is the day of salvation. I made up my mind when I was 17 to accept the invitation to accept the Lord Jesus as my saviour. And for me, that was the accepted time. And it also says in the scriptures, Matthew chapter 44, the Son of Man is coming at a time when you don't know when. The Lord Jesus, in, when he rose from the, uh, ascended after his resurrection and ascended into a heaven with a cloud and the angel said, don't worry, you'll see him again. He's coming back in the same way. And that's one of the verses that causes so many problems against the rapture theory and all that's associated with it. So what is the truth? What is the facts about the Lord Jesus coming again? Well, the Christian gospel teaches that the Lord Jesus Christ came to earth by God's grace through faith and lived and died according to the scriptures. And the scriptures said that he bore all our sins in his body on the tree. The Lord Jesus, in fact, took our sins upon him. And that's what I affirm when I uh, accept him as my Lord and Saviour. So God says words like this in the scriptures. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life goes on to say, the Lord Jesus didn't come to judge the world, he came to save the world. And all this mixed together makes it very difficult for some people to understand or want to identify with just specific times and places for the Lord Jesus to come back. In Romans chapter 9, he said that if you, and this is the verse that I believe I must have said when I accepted the Lord Jesus, but that was 73 years ago, 
I can't remember that far back. It, this is what they call the gospel in a nutshell. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life and be saved through him. And as you know, that's John 3, 16 and 17. So what, what is my thought on the world in which we're living? And I'm afraid I just can't grasp it. It just seems to be getting worse and worse and worse. And I think that the adult people in England and all around the world rejected God and is rejecting them and things are going to get worse. Sometimes the events we hear about are so horrific we don't really want to know about them because they're so evil. And as, as to all the wars and rumours of wars, there's very few places in the world that haven't got some sort of conflict in the present time. And so what's the message behind all of these events with Noah and uh, with Sodom and Gomorrah and with the book church at Rome? They've got similarities and that they, because they, in that they turned their backs on God and God punished them in different ways. And the message of the gospel is trust in the Lord Jesus with all your heart, with all your body, with all your soul and with all your mind. That's the first commandment. Second is like unto it, scripture says, and love your neighbour as yourself. Neighbourly love is something we can really do with, isn't it? I find it so difficult. Right, in closing, may I just say this. All through my life, I've had various things happen. I've probably had a cross-section of most human emotions. I've had depth of grief. I've had, I remember joy I had when I was holding my first great-grandchild. She was just a, a week old, and they gave her to me to have a cuddle. And that was a moment of real joy for me, that little tiny baby. And she's grown up to be about eight years old and probably taller than me now. So there have been times when it's been sad and difficult, but the Bible teaches, as we've already been reminded, that no matter where we are, whatever the situation around us, Whatever difficulties we're going through, physical, mental or spiritual, there's always somebody there with us. Not always easy to see, depending on circumstances, that God in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ and through the Holy Spirit, wherever we are, whatever our situation is, God tells us that I'm there with you. And I'm sure we can praise God for that. Thank you.